Welcome. In this ARC update, we'll talk about the excavation in RZAP in 2022, and also we're going to talk about the symposium at Agri University last year, 2023. And we have with us a special guest who's at the symposium. He's going to tell us about what happened there. So let's have a look at the background to what we did in 2022. Rewinding back to 2019, we met with Dr. Ihan from Kars University, and he began the process to get permits to work on the ARC site, but that's a major, major step. So he decided to do it in stages. So in 2022, Dr. Ihan went to Ankara and arranged with the Ministry of Tourism and Culture permission for the work that we wanted to do. The baby steps, so to speak, to begin getting a foothold into doing archaeological work in eastern Turkey. This is the invite letter. Here's the English translation where I was invited by Dr. Ihan. You can see his signature here. This is an official Ministry of Tourism and Culture logo and the university logo. I was requested to be there on the 1st of June 2022. And this is with official permission. This is the my official permit. This is a self-validating document. You can see there's a, a QR code you can scan. You can find this document on the Turkish government website to show this is a genuine document. And basically it gives me permission, a New Zealand national, as a team member in the survey Dr. Ihan was doing. So we caught up with Dr. Ihan. Also, we began using our ministry office. We built this office for the project. You can see us using the office here. And you can see the sign on the building, Culture and Tourism Ministry. This is all official and legal. And here's another sign here, Culture and Tourism Ministry. So this is all done legally and through the right channels. Now the survey we undertook was ancient fortresses around the feet, around the foot, if you like, of Mount Ararat. We were documenting and surveying some of the illegal digging that's going on. Unfortunately, a big problem in that part of Turkey is locals are finding ancient graves and digging them up and finding small gold treasures and things. So sadly, this has become quite an industry in the area and we are documenting some of these illegal digs. Also documenting some of the walls of ancient fortresses. You can see the line of rocks here and measuring them. These are ancient civilizations around that, the foot of that Mount Ararat. You can see some of the ancient walls here, measuring the heights. And this is some of the university students. These are students who are studying archaeology on our team. Here's a larger team picture. Some of these gentlemen, this gentleman is a professor from Istanbul University. The guy standing next to me on the left of the picture there with the sunglasses on is from the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. They embedded in our team someone to oversee and report back to the ministry what we were doing, everything's going according to the ministry guidelines. Now we had a preliminary dig at ARZAP after the survey. Back in 1977, Ron Wyatt found these enormous stones. You can see the hole at the top. Now this is very much like an anchor stone. This picture here is an anchor stone from the British Maritime Museum and this is found on a Roman shipwreck. These stones that Ron found are the same design except much larger. You can see the size of them. These are huge. These would weigh over 10 tonnes probably. And where Ron found these was in a village. This is all documented in the book produced by Mary Nell, the boat-shaped object on Doomsday Mountain. And there's a whole section dealing with the discoveries Ron made on that first trip, including these anchor stones. And documented this book is this ruins of an ancient building here and areas where there were these fence lines. Here's a close-up of that there. And you can see these fence lines today. Here's a picture, photograph. You can see these lines of stones along here. These date way back. These are probably fences. Here's Hugo and myself standing next to them. You can see the size of these boulders. These are massive. So whoever set up these fences obviously was very strong, shall we say, or had a big workforce. And we believe, of course, after the flood, 
the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days before the flood. And the generations straight after the flood were of big size as well. We know when the Israelites went to the promised land and they sent the spies into the land and the spies came back and said, there's giants in the land. Ten of the spies says they couldn't do it. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, yes, we can do it. You might recall that story. So there were giants living in Israel at the time. And even 500 years later, when in the days of King Saul, there was the giant Goliath. So some tribes of the earth retained their large size for many years. And these stone fences obviously were built by people of great strength. Now nearby was this building Ron found. This is as it was, as he discovered it in 1977. And beside this were two tomb markers. Now these were not anchor stones. There was no hole at the top here. But they had on them a carving depicting, Ron said, a rainbow with a boat on a wave and eight people. Very intriguing. Now you can see on the picture here that crosses were carved on later, probably during the Byzantine period, but the underlying carving showed this picture of eight people under a rainbow with a boat. Now Ron put these in a book that he published and locals later were asked by some visiting person from the United States, where are these stones? And unfortunately, the locals were paid to dig up one of these graves. And in 1984-85, somewhere around then, one of those graves was dug up by the locals. And the reports were a large stone sarcophagus was found, enormous size, and inside was a large skeleton. In fact, the locals have found in some of the graves in that area large bones, huge human bones. There's a jawbone was on display in a hotel for a while where the jawbone was like twice normal size, huge. Well, after the other locals heard about what had been found, a grave with some valuable things in it, of course, this is what happened to that building. Shortly after, it ended up looking like this. The locals, sadly, go looking for treasures. They'll tear things apart. They don't have much respect for antiquities. So we wanted to excavate in this area and see what could be found, especially where that sarcophagus supposedly was discovered. A team was organised by Dr. Ihan, as you can see here. This is the area being marked off by the tapes and the surface layer was removed over this whole area. And of course, this is all done through the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. You can see the official signs here. And here's Hugo pointing out this official sign with the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Logo here. This is all done through the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. Here we are measuring the, the remains of the building. The building was excavated beneath where the walls have been pulled apart and you can see the foundation going down into the ground. You can see the height of the dirt on the outside. This shows after perhaps millennia, soil being washed down the hill, building up on those walls. A lot of soil gets moved around at the time. And they dug, of course, in the area where those grave markers were. And incidentally, one of those graves, the graves that had been dug up in the 80s, was about here, next to where I'm standing. And they dug up to that area. And we knew there were two grave markers. So we said to the archaeologist, we don't know how far apart those graves were. Maybe the second grave was further out. So they needed to dig where I'm pointing. And so they did that. They extended that dig, as you can see here, and they discovered here a skull. And you can see the archeologist excavating away here. And this was the skull and the skeleton of a small child. This is a shallow grave, less than a metre deep. So this is probably someone from, we don't know the exact date at this point, probably maybe a thousand years ago, Armenian times. And this grave was about just under a metre deep. And so here they are, very sad, probably a child died of disease or something. And they kept digging, and just next to this grave, a bit deeper, they found another complete skeleton. Again, this is from modern Armenian times. You can see the archaeologist clearing away here. And this was a youngish person too, probably in their 30s. You can see the teeth are in good condition there. So that's what we discovered on that dig. Are the graves of Noah possibly in that area? We don't know. 
maybe deeper down because don't forget over thousands of years a lot of soil is built up so maybe some more work needs to be done in that area. So here's the building remains, it was excavated. They determined that this was a very ancient building and later had been turned, it appears, into a church, like a chapel or a worship place. And you can see at the far end, it's shaped like an Armenian church. And so, and you can see the two different layers of stones. So this building was adapted for later use. And also they discovered in the floor of this building, lots of clay pots with ashes in them. This would indicate that people wanted to be buried at this location. And that is another intriguing clue. Why would people want to have their remains buried at the site? Obviously it has some connection, we believe, with the Ark and those who got off it. Now in 2023, I was invited to Agri University Symposium by the university staff here. They said it would be an honour to host you at our symposium. This symposium is run every two years, and this was the seventh annual symposium. And you can see the audience here. They had two lecture theatres going, one in English and one in Turkish. And this is the poster for that symposium. You can see it's all about, it's the seventh international symposium on Mount Ararat and Noah's Ark. Here's the Ark site here. And there's a picture of Mount Ararat in the background. Here's the poster for the symposium and they accepted abstracts, so those who did lectures or talks gave an abstract and I've sent that off recently. You can see who sponsored the symposium. This is Andrews University in Michigan, was one of the sponsors. It was interesting around the town, they had billboards up advertising the symposium, so clearly they had a good advertising budget for that. Here's me giving a lecture on why the site is most likely the remains of Noah's Ark. Here's another photograph here. This is me explaining the cubit measurements, how that this site is exactly 300 of the cubits you'd expect that Moses would have been familiar with in the Bible. And here's Dr. Randall Yonker from Andrews University giving me the certificate at the end of my presentation. And just to, by the way, uh, I'm not a professor or a doctor. <laughs> I did not say that I was, but that's what they put me down as. We also caught up with Dr. Sully Bayrak Tutin while we were there. He was at the symposium giving a, a talk about the geology of the Noah's Ark site. And Dr. Sully Bayrak Tutin had worked with Ron Wyatt, David Fassold, and John Baumgardner way back when the original research was being done back in the 80s. And even though John Baumgardner has decided subsequently he doesn't believe it's Noah's Ark, Dr. Sully Barak Tutin, who studied the geology there and has studied the site itself, says, we, we talked to him in the cafeteria, he says 101% that is Noah's Ark. So no matter what critics say, the locals, the geologist, the professor here is saying, this is definitely Noah's Ark. Now I was at the symposium with my good friend Murat Shahin and also my good friend Hugo Bain, who's sitting right beside me here. Welcome Hugo. Thank you Ross. Good to be here. So tell us about your experience at the symposium. Well, it was uh, a real privilege to be able to go. And, um, and obviously we went there together mm -hmm. and we really weren't too sure what was going to come of it. But our friend Murat said we needed to be there. Mm -hmm. And he's very familiar with the ultimate goal of what we want to achieve. And that is to do an excavation on Noah's Ark. So what I found at the symposium was it was to do with the region of Mount Ararat and the sites, the potential sites of Noah's Ark. Now, you and I, we're only interested in one site. We're convinced that it's the Darupanar site. But what we found through the symposium was the fact that many people were acknowledging that that's a potential site, but in their hearts, they're thinking that maybe Noah's Ark still to be found elsewhere or even on the mountain, the, you know, the Mount Ararat. Yet the Bible says it's the mountains of Ararat, the plural. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what was great was you did your presentation mm -hmm. and the, the compelling evidence that you gave for the Darupana site. Mm -hmm. Darupana was the man, obviously, who first discovered yes. that site in 1959. Um, but the compelling evidence that you gave far exceeded anything else that anyone presented in suggesting that there were other sites, even on the volcano of Mount Ararat. 
Yeah, so so that was interesting. Yeah, and obviously is, Turkey is a Muslim country, yes. and so there was a lot of Muslim presenters there, and they're, they're talking from the perspective of the Quran, yes, which yes. does mention yes. Noah's Ark. Um, but it mentions that it's on Mount Judy. In mm -hmm. Mount Judy, they're thinking there's potentially four Mount Judys. One's in southern Turkey, there's one in Iraq, and there's yes. others, you know. Yes. So they're all still thinking maybe Noah's Ark still to be found. Um, but, you know, but the site that we were interested in was certain that really it was the focus of the symposium, which was great to see. Absolutely. Yeah. And some interesting information came out at the same time of the symposium. You might recall uh, a university had done a survey of the area about a year before, I believe and they'd taken samples of pottery all around the, the site. And the results of that survey came out just at the time of the symposium. And it caused such ripples, it, it went around newspapers around the world. It was in The Sun, it was in The Daily Mail, it was in The New York Post, and many other media outlets published this. That what the scientists were saying was, the pottery and other artefacts found right around the site date back to the earliest times of human civilization. This is like the oldest pottery that people have ever found and it's around that site and so they were saying this site has been occupied by humans from the earliest times recorded and that caused quite a stir because of course we're saying this is Noah's Ark and here's a scientific survey saying yes this site has been occupied for as long as they can determine. It was great actually wasn't it because it was Ibrahim Chechen University yes, and Istanbul yes. Technic University yes. combined with Andrews University from yes. the States. Yes. And, and we found out the symposium that maybe Noah's Ark is at a different place. And uh, yet the tests that they had done at this yeah. site, um, they've ne you know, they now need to go back and do more work at this site yes. just from their own research, yes. even though they're thinking maybe Noah's Ark still on yes. the big volcano yes. or on Mount Judy's. Or whatever, you know. So that was good news, wasn't it? Yes, it's good news. It's giving them reason to have to go back there, which is what, what we really want. Now also we went on some field trips. Part of the symposium were field trips on Mount Ararat and to the Noah's Ark site itself. So maybe you could tell us about some of these pictures. Here in this picture you can see we're with this gentleman here. His name is Dr. Faru Kaya. He's the vice rector of the university that host a symposium and he'd be one of the key figures in any work that's done on the Noah's Ark site and so here's Hugo and I on Mount Ararat on the field trip up there with him. We went with a number of other people. Interesting in this picture you can see here here's somebody supplied by the gendarme, the Turkish gendarme to accompany us and you can see he's got an automatic weapon there because interestingly just a couple of weeks before we were on the mountain on this day a Turkish drone, high-flying drone, had spotted a group of PKK guerrillas on this mountain. And it actually, I believe, fired a missile and killed some of these guerrillas. And so guerrilla activity is still a problem in the area. Thankfully, it's not stopping us doing our research, but it just shows the tensions are still there. And so they assigned this soldier to come with us just in case anything flared up. We had some protection. Here's a picture showing myself with Dr. Faruk Kai and also Dr. Randall Yonker from Andrews University and also Dr. Octay Belli from the Istanbul Research, Archaeological Research Institute. So it was really worthwhile going there to accept the invitation and be able to present the positive evidence and many of the people sitting there had not heard this evidence. So how did you think it went? I think it was, agree, totally worthwhile and we really didn't know what we would get out of it no. or what we would contribute. But your presentation was fantastic because it's such compelling evidence. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, we found out by the end of the symposium that uh, we know who in the future is yeah. going to be yeah. doing any excavation work yeah. or any kind of survey, whatever it is, yeah. in the region of Noah's Ark and yeah. Mount Ararat. Yeah and it will be those three universities. Yes. And we've got to know them all, yes. the, the decision makers. They appreciated our effort to come all the way over from New Zealand. Yes. And so hopefully we'll be a part of whatever they decide in the future, mm. which has always been our dream because we, we want to do an excavation on Noah's Ark, but we can't do it. That's meaningless. Yes. 
the uh, Turkish authorities, with the permission of the government, have to do it. Yeah. So we've got clarity on it now. So we're very blessed to meet Dr. Farouk Kaya. Interestingly, the government announced plans of a new museum and visitor centre. This was announced by the governor of Agri, you can see him here, with this gentleman who was a very well-to-do property developer from Istanbul, but he was actually born in the village above the Ark site. And together they announced the building of a new visitor centre museum for the Ark site. You can see the architectural drawings here. There's the Ark site in the background. And this is the new building, the car park. And the signs here, if you look at them, says Noah's Ark Museum. In other words, the government has no qualm saying this is Noah's Ark. Even though the evidence is, I believe, overwhelming and yet excavations haven't even started yet, will everyone accept the evidence, even if it was excavated? Do you know, it's interesting that the Bible says that Noah moved by faith. It says, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world. And he's considered one of the heirs of righteousness, which is by faith. It says in the Bible that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And yet, although God had given this warning to the world, how did the people in the days of Noah receive Noah's warning? It's interesting, here's a quote from Heavenly Places, one of E.G. White's books, it says, God warned the inhabitants of the old world of what he purposed to do and cleansing the earth of its impurity. But they laughed to scorn what they regarded as a superstitious prediction. They mocked at Noah's warning of a coming flood. It says Noah was regarded as a fanatic the threatenings of God, they said, are for their purpose of intimidating and will never be verified. You need not be alarmed, they said. Such an event is the destruction of the world by the God who made it and the punishment of the beings he has created will never take place. Be at peace, fear not. Noah is a wild fanatic. It says the world made merry at the folly of the deluded old man. Have a look at this statement here. They considered him insane. They laughed at him and mocked him. But still he kept at work and building the ark according to God's directions. And when the last message of Noah was given to that degenerate age, as he stood before the people giving his warning, they turned from him to ridicule him. Basically, the whole world rejected that message. And yet you can imagine as the floodwaters rose, how people realized that they were the ones that were deluded and you can imagine people wanting to get on the ark after that. But you know what? It was too late. That door had closed. Probation had closed for that generation. And you know, that's a type, that's a symbol of our generation. There is coming again a closing of probation. A door is going to be shut, not on a physical ark, but on the chance for salvation. And we have to warn people of what's coming. What will happen to those who give this warning message to the world? Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So how will people receive the message in the last days here, now, today, in our generation? You know, it talks about in Second Peter, it says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, this is when we're living, what, who's coming? Scoffers, it says. Scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And notice what goes on here. It says, for this they willingly are ignorant of. So these scoffers are going to be willingly ignorant of something. What is it they're going to be willingly ignorant of? Notice what it says, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, in other words, creation, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This is talking about Noah's flood. So in our day, in the last days, the time we're living, there's going to be scoffers who are going to choose to be ignorant of evidence of the flood. Do you think if Noah's ark was excavated and it could be seen clearly that this is Noah's ark, will everybody accept it? No, people will scoff at it. 
but you know a lot of people will accept the truth. And that's our goal and purpose in wanting to excavate it because it's going to be a powerful tool to show many people who are sitting on the fence that the Bible is true and that God intervened in the past in human history and he's about to do it again. So that's our goal, that's our purpose in wanting to excavate this site.